Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm really excited for today's session, so thanks for joining us. This is gonna be probably a little bit more interactive than some of the sessions you've been to in the past, uh, so please join us and bring your, your best insights and perspectives into the conversation here. Um, we have 90 minutes together, so uh, hopefully we can cover a lot of ground. Uh, as Steph said, I'm Warren. Uh, I'm part of our team at Amy, and I'm focused uh, a lot on talent. I spend my time helping to build a community of AI talent and uh, bring really great professional development, uh, career development opportunities to our talent pool. Uh, so you'll probably bump into me um, throughout the week and, uh, and even beyond Upper Bound. Um, so looking forward to meeting a lot of our visitors. Um, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by some really fantastic panelists. I'm going to leave it to each of them to share their name and introduce themselves, but you're gonna get a really great mix of perspectives to tap into today, talking about the next generation of, of AI careers, what you can be looking for you know, as an employer, and what you can be looking for as someone who's maybe navigating your, your next steps uh, beyond grad school. So to start off, I'll maybe hand it over to Ezra. Hello, my name is Esra, and um, I'm a current master's in computer science student. I specialize in AI and ML, and I work with Dr. Michael Bowling on fundamental reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, and today, to foreshadow, I will be telling you more about how I secured some, I creatively secured some <laughs> internships, <laughs> um, and my path towards that. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Yulia Mikhailovska. I work on the talent team at Greylock. Greylock is a venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley. I'm based in New York, first time in Edmonton. Very exciting. And I've spent the last three and a half years helping early career engineering product and design talent find opportunities within early stage startups in particular. Uh, prior to that, I spent two and a half years working with students from Stanford University who were trying to navigate towards jobs in New York City. And prior to that, I had a mix of experiences across another venture fund and three different startups. So I love the job search. I'm really hoping that today you can come out with some creative ideas, uh, to Estra's point. I think in this market, you have to be creative. And frankly, a lot of the best positions don't get posted. So we'll talk a lot about how do you find those opportunities? How did she find that opportunity? How can Amy help you with that? And how can you also navigate a lot of different resources to do that when we'll go through some case studies and other things. But really excited to be here, and I am very passionate about helping connect people to the right opportunities and to the right peers and people in the network. And I'm Mara Cairo, product owner of the advanced technology team at Amy. My team really connects our industry partners to the talent and expertise needed to build these machine learning models to solve whatever business problem they've come to us for help with. A lot of my job is recruitment. I play a bit of a matchmaker when we're working with clients from the industry who are needing specific talent. We go out and we recruit the best of the best, um, bringing in the right sort of ML expertise and domain expertise to make sure we can drive the projects forward. So the recruitment end of things has sort of fallen into my lap over the last several years as I've been in this position. So I have some insights that are hopefully helpful to you all today. Awesome. So we know a little bit about who uh, we have access to here from today. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, and this is what we're going to talk about. So to start off, uh, we'll have a bit of an exercise to hear from all of you. Um, then we're going to answer questions like, what do the next wave of AI careers even look like? What can drive some of the choices that you might have to make you know, consciously or unconsciously uh, throughout your journey? Um, what's attractive about the different types of companies? Uh, what they're looking for? Again, insight from Yulia, who's connected into some incredible companies uh, across the world that Greylock's invested in, helping them secure really critical hires. She knows a lot about how they're, they're thinking about things, and, and Mara as well, uh, and Ezra from the, the applicant side, having secured some stuff in the past. Uh, so you'll get to see what this looks like in practice, and we're going to go through some real, recent, you know, relevant examples with some people that you might actually recognize and that you might actually bump into throughout Upper Bound. Um, at the end, there will be time for questions as well. If you have a burning question throughout uh, that you think is really relevant, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you. We want to make sure this is a dialogue kind of back and forth uh, over the, the time we have together. Um, 
So to start off, we're going to jump into a quick Slido activity. So if you don't mind, please uh, pull out your phone. Uh, everyone should be used to these QR codes by now. Um, but we have a, an interactive uh, live uh, data integration here through, uh, through Slido where we're going to be able to see uh, in real time uh, responses to some of the, the questions that we're going to go through today. Uh, and we'll talk through uh, uh, with our, our panel as well. So I'll give everyone just a quick moment to, uh, to hop on. Uh, you can, if you want, you can just go to sli.do as well if you're QR code averse, uh, and just enter in uh, NXT GEN. You'll you'll join us. If uh, you're QR code averse, maybe <laughs> you're yeah. in the wrong industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. So we'll give everyone a quick moment. Anyone needs some extra time? Frantically scanning QRs. Great. I see one. I see one. I'll give you a second. <laughs> You got this. OK. Thank you so much. Um, so to start off, just to get a sense of kind of who's in the room um, and your timeline, uh, please let us know. When, when are you graduating? Recently graduated? Is it still a few years off? Uh, we'll be talking about things that you might not need to wait to start with uh, in terms of how you can explore your, your career. Um, so yeah, let us know. I'm super curious of the 60% who have already graduated, who's secured a role, or who's still looking? Yes. Should we ask the, the pro or the con? I don't know. Actually, yeah, show of hands if you have already graduated. Do you have a job currently? And if you have already graduated, are you looking for a role? Keep Throw that hand up. A few of those or you too. graduated and you have a job, but you realize already it's not the job, so you're looking again. <laughs> yeah. That happens yeah, yeah, too, we, very quickly. <laughs> that's why we keep the room dark. We won't hold it against <laughs> exactly, you. <laughs> <Yeah. exactly. laughs> that's good. Okay. Um, so yeah, a, another one here, which degree level are you currently pursuing? Um, or uh, if you are one of the, the few that, that have uh, graduated already, uh, what was your most recent um, program? Lots of masters. In good company, Ezra. <laughs> oh, this is a good mix too. It's pretty yeah. even. Okay. That's awesome. Well, I, th I think today we'll be able to provide some insight and takeaways for, for each of these different levels as yeah, well. Yeah, we have case studies across different degree levels. So you'll see how an undergrad maybe navigated something versus somebody who was considering a PhD and maybe decided not to go that path. So get excited. <laughs> the hot takes. OK. Um, yeah, just which uh, we know Upper Bound brings together an incredibly cool international group of talent from, from all over the world. So um, getting a sense of you know, which geography uh, you're most excited about in terms of where you might be spending time post-graduation uh, in your career. Uh, lots, of, lots of Western Canada popping up here. That's great. Happy to hear the, the smoke isn't scaring anyone away. OK. This is a pretty good mix, too. Europe. By show of hands, who is visiting from outside of, of Alberta? OK. All right, you're in good company, because there's, I think, close to 1,000 uh, talent bursaries that have been uh, sent out this year. So some really incredible international people to meet. Uh, I know I've been enjoying bumping into people from uh, all over the place. OK, uh, this one is going to involve a little bit more input from you. You don't just get to select an option. Um, so when you're imagining your future career, um, which companies are top of mind for you right now? Uh, wow, somebody really loves Amy. So <laughs> part of this question is, um, I think one of the challenges a lot of job seekers face is when they think about where to apply, like five companies come to mind. And it's like the five companies that your friends have interned at or people that you work with have been at. Uh, and it's really important to actively be broadening that list. Um, one of the resources I'll mention later, they ha you go through an exercise and you come up with 40 to 50 names of companies that make sense for you. Um, you know, a lot of these are big tech names, and that's totally fine. You know, the company Esra ended up interning at, it was, it's not on this list. I don't see it. So no one knows about it yet. So you know, we're going to talk a little bit of how do you come up with ideas that maybe are a little bit less explored, but still amazing companies, and have alumni from Google Brain or Apple or other businesses. Because there's a lot of people who join big tech companies, they miss that you know, ownership and quick pace of work and a bit of room for growth. So where do the alums of these businesses go, right? And not just thinking of, here are the five companies I could possibly work at, but the 
the ocean is a bit bigger than that. This is great. Um, I love seeing a few I want to start my own companies in there. That's fantastic. We'll be talking a lot about entrepreneurship and, and startups uh, as well. So. Uh, this is great. Thanks for your input on this. Uh, again, we're... I love the my own. Whoever is trying to do that, good for you. <laughs> so good. Yeah, that's good. Some are less choosy. That's great. Okay. Um, so this is a timely question, given we have a, a really great event after this where you can connect with some companies, many of which are, are recruiting. Um, are, if you are looking for a job or an internship in the next six months, yes or no, let us, let us know. This is anonymous also. If you are here with, uh, with an employer, no. <laughs> we, we won't tell. OK, so lots of people are on the hunt. That's, that's great. Um, interesting insight here. For those of you who maybe uh, have been exploring your career for a little while, have you ever had an offer rescinded? This is a changing landscape in tech right now. Uh, this is a not uncommon thing to have occur. Um, moving forward, so. And we will talk about someone who had their offer rescinded and ended up in a really amazing place. And so we'll talk about what did that person do to move quickly to get to that next offer efficiently and also make sure it's de-risked, quote unquote, a bit. Awesome. It's good, so a few, a few people have been in this situation. So that's, that's great, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk a bit about that as a, a thing to, to navigate. Okay. Two different worlds. Um, it's not to say that uh, there's not some in between here, but just getting an idea of uh, when you're you're thinking about that future career. Most interested in some of those big tech companies, like we saw a few names like like Google and and Facebook uh, come in uh, on the the previous question, um, or you know the world of of startups and emerging uh, companies. It's also the option. Lots of people want to pursue academic careers as well. So let us know. Some people are just open. Want to work on something that they like. What about you, Mara? Were you more coming out of, uh, coming out of school engineering? Were you like big into the, the startup world? It was a long time ago. I don't know. Um, hmm. I think the startup journey always interested me a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. We have a, a really fantastic alumni community that has gone on to start some pretty cool companies. And we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today, too. Okay, um, this is, uh, yeah, getting to the tail end here. So a couple more questions to get through, but uh, for those of you who are interested in that startup world, um, can you name a, a venture fund that's investing in, in AI and ML? Oh, I, I was expecting this answer. Some people are coming straight from the flying fish office hours and <laughs> maybe have that top of mind. We've got Greylock. So, all right, Yale Town, nice. Flying Fish and Greylock. There are, are a lot of venture capital firms out there that invest in startups. So I, I hope your list grows after this. Um, but I mean, it's it's the thing that everyone's doing right now. So even folks who are not AI focused only are now AI investors. And so you have to kind of figure out who was in it before this hype began. Who's this in it for the long run? Yeah. Awesome, thanks for the insight here. It's glad to see some familiar names pop out. YC invests in everything, so Sahil, you're right. Yes, they're in every single sector. <laughs> awesome. What's the benefit to funds that exclusively invest in ML? That's a really great question. So I, um, some of the AI ML funds are pretty recent, and so their track record isn't quite there yet, right? You might see some early wins, but at the end of the day, every fund will have some amazing wins, and that's the ones that they'll talk about. What I like to look for, and something I wasn't aware of back when I was a student, is look for funds, not just the fund itself, but who's the investment partner? Because that person, you want them to have expertise and have built companies in that space or have been in it for more than a few cycles. So as most of you probably know, it takes you know seven to 10 years to really even see how an investment pans out. So if there's absolutely been examples of earlier in their career investors who've made the right bet, but you really want to see not just are they actively investing, but have those investments panned out. So if I were looking in security tech, I would try and find who are investors who've been through multiple cycles, also in terms of recessions and you know increases and decreases, et cetera, and who has been able to keep investing and stay in the game. So if you see somebody or even a fund that's been around for more than a decade or two, that's 
pretty compelling because it means they've been able to ride out the economic changes versus there's been a lot of new things come up in the ecosystem now and TBD where things shake out when people are looking for returns and seeing were those the proper investments. So I, I think the kind of to your question, it's it, it is good to have specialists, but there's also large funds that are not specialists, but they might have the unique people in that company who know a field very well that you can have comfort knowing, okay, they have vetted the business and they know what they're talking about. That's good insight also. Um, I jumped the gun on our next question here, so we're already getting some really good responses, but um, when you're thinking about finding those jobs, I, Yulia just gave some really sound advice on, you know, if you're finding VC funds that are making really great bets and, and building great companies, um, they can often be a, a good source to, to discover something new. Um, but outside of that, we've seen a lot of uh, LinkedIn and a lot of nep nepotism, I like that one. That, if you can use it, uh, that's great. Um, lots of referrals, that's something we'll, we'll talk a lot about today as well. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of the things you can, you can look for beyond, uh, beyond the obvious as well. So it's, it's nice to get um, some of these common uh, paths uh, out there and know that, that uh, everyone's, everyone's on that track. So I'm gonna jump right over. Okay. So we've heard from you. Um, this is a really great insight. Thanks so much for sharing. I hope you enjoyed the, the Slido. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about AI careers and some trends that we see. Um, and talk a little bit about what we're not gonna talk about for most of the, most of the time today as well. So um, to start us off, um, I just wanna throw out there that um, a lot of times when you're thinking about that future state, uh, you kind of think about that as a, a linear path, a next step. Um, you know, we, we all experience this in academia as we're going through grade school. <laughs> you feel that way. It's just that like the academic environment, it feels like it sets you up for that sort of thinking. Because there's a natural progression from like, oh, undergrad, master's, PhD. But the real world just doesn't work that way. Yeah, the, the what you get can often be uh, a, a really meandering path, uh, sometimes forward, sometimes backwards, and uh, uh, does, doesn't always look the same for, for everyone. So, so keep that in mind. That's something we'll, we'll be uh, uh, talking about here, actually. So um, this is an example from our alumni community of most of the, I guess, the path that we're not going to talk as much about today. So. Um, this is a, an alumni who did their undergrad uh, at Cambridge before coming uh, to work with us here uh, and do a PhD with uh, Dr. Rich Sutton, whom many of you might likely have bumped into this week, um, before joining DeepMind, uh, leading the AlphaGo project. Does anyone know who this is? That's right. Uh, so yeah, David Silver is a, an example of, of uh, you know that, that career path that sometimes um, you know, from the outside can look pretty linear and, and pretty incredible. Like this is like a really, really uh, uh, incredible example of alumni coming out of, of Alberta and out of the reinforcement learning uh, work that's happening here. Um, but David Silver actually didn't have as much of a linear path as, as that might seem like in what I described there. So before, you know, going back to grad school, he actually started a video game company. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and so one common theme that I want you to keep in mind today is like, even you know, from the outside, you know, everyone's journey is, is unique. Uh, it might seem linear and obvious uh, from what you see on LinkedIn and, and uh, from interacting with people, but there's a lot you can really uncover by digging a few layers deeper. So uh, even with an example who might seem really familiar and obvious, there's, there's often really great insight and a journey to learn more about that uh, is more of that kind of loopy meandering path uh, that, that many careers can often look like. Okay, um, so we talked a little bit about kind of that, if you wanna go in that career path towards academia and research, that's what we're gonna be talking the least about today. I don't wanna necessarily frame that uh, in that you know, anything we're saying is not relevant if you are wanting to pursue a career path in that direction. Um, it, you'll definitely have a lot of takeaways for that as well. But because there's a lot of really great resources out there um, and, uh, you know, it's something that might already be more familiar, we're going to spend most of the day really pulling great insight from this panel um, on these other two trends. Uh, so overall, we, we do see a lot of graduate level AI talent kind of branch off into these three categories. It's probably overgeneralizing to a certain extent, but just a pattern that we see between that academic research sort of journey, 
Uh, moving into more like industry and application, sometimes in enterprise companies and big tech, um, and entrepreneurship and startups. Whether you're an entrepreneur yourself and want to start your own thing, or you want to join an, an early company and, and have that journey. So those, you know, number two and three are what we're going to talk the most about today. This is something we also ask all of our incoming talent uh, in our Amy community. So um, it can sometimes seem pretty, like pretty. Uh, uh, it's a perspective that's out there. Um, I hear about this a lot, and I I'm, I always play the devil's advocate. But um, a lot of people think that if you're just because you're in grad school, you want to go into academia and research. And uh, is that your experience as well? I feel like a lot of students start out that way. And then they start thinking about different things as they're exposed to more people. Um, I, yeah, I think that like it really makes a difference when you can bump into people who have, you know, they, they started their own startups. That inspires you to do different things as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I also think there's a, a counter perspective where, um, you know, you might come in and we see a lot of talent coming into a master's with a, the idea that they want to go into industry and application. Uh, and after a couple of years, um, sometimes longer, no, no shame, um, it might be the thing that's really familiar and it might seem like that kind of seamless next step to go and do a PhD uh, as, a, as a second step. And that's, that's definitely not you know, a, a bad idea in, in many cases. Um, so it is something that, my point here is that this can change. Uh, at any point in time, you might, you might subscribe to you know, leaning in one direction or another, um, but that can definitely change. And we do see that change uh, throughout our talent pool's uh, journey as well. So um, you don't have to necessarily feel like you're pigeonholed into one of these columns. Yes, I need to awkwardly pass the clicker now. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna shuffle that along. <laughs> All right, and just to, for a second, go back. Um, one thing that's really interesting within academia and research, and this was a recent article in The Economist, is that we're AI, because it's been more commercially driven from the very beginning, you're actually seeing industry responsible for equal or maybe even more research than academia, right? And so if you love research, there's absolutely those opportunities in industry. And so there's a little bit of overlap between those first two uh, pieces point. there. So I wanted to highlight that. And what I wanted to talk about first, and, and please, if you disagree with some of these things, let's engage. Uh, this is a, I know it's, we have an hour together and I want the whole panel to, to participate, but also as the audience, please do engage. So what we're gonna talk about first is what's driving some of the career search choices and what should, what do companies look for, but also what can candidates be looking for when they're evaluating different opportunities. I've worked with thousands of job seekers by this point and the thing that always starts off a search is confusion, sheer confusion. So let's go there, let's all get confused together. Here was a list that Warren pulled from what drives career choices for the Amy Community, group, community, talent, I'm talent, like student yeah. body, but it's not just students, right? Yeah. So probably some of these things resonate for you, and um, Esther, I would love your thoughts on what drove your choices most as you were thinking about it, but you know, everybody wants to be working on an interesting product or problem. I will caveat here, if you ever talk to a talent professional, have a more descriptive answer to this than that first point. Everybody I talk to wants to work on meaningful, interesting work. So what does that really mean for you? Does it mean that you want to work on healthcare applications because that's the sector you're most excited about? Does it mean that you want to work on the newest technology? Get a bit broader color on that when you discuss your interests with folks. Yeah. And how these are, these are numbered here, but they, they probably shouldn't be. These shouldn't be ranked. Um, and everyone is going to rank them differently as well. But um, is there anything that stands out? Is anyone like, oh, yeah, that one is, is definitely top of mind for me? Like for me, when I, I think one can really consistent criteria was that it's really about people for me. And for quite a bit of oppor the opportunities that I got, I really emphasized in my head that I wanted people that I want, be, want to be with people that I want to be like. Um, so for example, for the last one, it was a startup called Atomic, and we're gonna go into that. And a lot of the selling points for me were, um, 
primarily because I was excited about this very specific niche challenging research area that they were trying to crack and like apply it in the real world. Um, but at the same time, we, there was a really inspiring CEO that I got to talk to. And that really made, made it all click for me. What I love about your point is like also people's, the, this hierarchy changes. Esra has moved up on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs to focusing on the manager and people. And maybe some of you have heard people leave managers. They don't leave like the role or company. They leave the managers or people they directly work with. So this is what happens when you have a few different experiences. You start to focus on people more and more. Initially, a lot of people, what drives their choice is salary. And that's, you know, it's okay, we can all be honest here. Sometimes you take a job because of what it pays. But as you get older and you realize salary is not the thing that makes or breaks your like eight, nine, 10 hours of your working day, you start to focus on the people. So we called it out just because it's the elephant in the room. For what it's worth, most people who go and work at startups are not driven by salary, they're driven by other missions. That is something that can come with time. But we wanted to share what drives the choices for you to have that very clear in your mind of, what are actually the factors you're considering? Because for a lot of job seekers, you just start a search thinking, I need a job, but you're not thinking, what do I want out of that job and what are my priorities? The clearer you have this upfront, the easier it is then once you have your offers to make decisions. If you're confused about your motivations going in, you will absolutely get more confused when it comes time to deciding. I, I really like this. Um, I, I highlighted this you know, and bolded this uh, because it's unanimously the top choice every time we ask graduate students this, which um, I, I might seem obvious. You know, at that point in your life, this might be something that is a, a top of mind. You know, you might have higher tuition. Uh, you know, other other things going on where you know uh, thinking financially about your your future is probably a, a higher priority than maybe at other points. So I guess a good takeaway here is that even for an individual, these can really change and and evolve over time. Um, and I, I think we, this is overrepresented because it is graduate students uh, that we sampled here. So, okay, I just wanted to follow up on the salary thing. So, like, what Yulia is saying is not that like you should be accepting a non-livable wage. That's not. That's not really. <laughs> that's I don't not know what I said. Very yeah, good point. I'm from so, New York. Life is expensive. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize that because sometimes people start to think like there's a misconception that when I want to go for a startup it necessarily means that I'm going to accept something that like, it's, like, is nonsense. Like, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, so definitely, you want to look for something that is livable and that you know, respects you as a human being. Um, but at the same time, Yulia is trying to emphasize that the highest, highest like, upper ranges may not be there always for yeah, startups. Yeah, like, you're not comparing an ML startup to a trading firm, right? Like, you have to go into knowing these um, trade-offs. So other factors to consider, as and Ezra mentioned some of them, are who's on the leadership team? A lot of the leadership teams of these ML and AI startups are coming from really exceptional employees at those big tech companies you listed earlier, right? They are people who've put in their time, put in their dues, learned some specialty and had an idea and decided to go with it. So the leadership team, and in particular the founders, as well as your direct manager, that's a really important factor to consider. And the cool thing is in a, a smaller company, like a startup, you get to actually meet the entire team up front versus getting surprised at the end of your big tech process of who will I work with. There's also a piece about culture and values. I know the last panel talked about that, right? Understanding the mission and like what people actually stand for. The size of company, right? Is it a 10 person operation, 100 people? et cetera, those are going to be very different uh, work experiences as well as the networks you build from a place that has a few dozen employees versus just a smaller network. Um, and then the last one I'll touch on, and you can touch on a few of the others if you like, is is machine learning at the core of the business or is it adjacent, is it a side project? And by that I mean um, there's a lot of businesses, for example, marketplace companies, where they might deploy ML and AI to help make better predictions and whatnot, but that's not going to be the core of the business. So you have to think about do you want to work where machine learning is at the core of the business or is it something that is getting newly deployed and maybe a little bit less fleshed out? Yeah, I mean, what I liked about the um, ML at the core, at least, companies, because that was something I was filtering for a lot of the time, is that you're really like on the front lines. <laughs> like, if things don't work, you know, the whole company won't work. And, and, and you're going that, all in. You're like, if it doesn't work, was, I want to 
the whole thing to not work. <laughs> yeah, but that was also thrilling because then you felt a sense of responsibility for you know making the business case for your work. Um, there, it's also it can also happen in the ML as a, like a JSON thing, um, but I really selected for the ML out of core. Maybe just touching on the reputation piece, I think it's important to realize that someone else's experience is not necessarily your experience. If there's like consistent reputation stories that you're hearing about a certain company, yes, for sure, like consider those. But I just, I've gone through, you know, companies on Glassdoor and whatnot, and you can convince yourself that any company is horrible if you talk <laughs> to the right person. But I, I do think you should keep doors open and let yourself experience things for yourself because it can vary significantly between person. And reputation and culture and values, by the way, those are all things very much set by the leadership team. So you know that saying where like the something rots from the head down? Like that is why it's really important to do the research about who are the founders, how have they interacted with folks in the past. You know, there's a lot of back channeling that happens where you want to understand what is it like to work with that person, but you also see it during the interview process, right? You didn't know the team you joined, but you get to see how do they treat you. And a lot of those signs and flags you pick up along the way will lead to the reputation of what it's like to work there, but also how the business itself is run. Absolutely. And what I think is, is interesting for emerging talent is often, if you're not thinking about these things, like if you're not considering them, um, you're kind of making some subconscious or, or unconscious decisions about them along the way. And the other side of the table, when you're applying for roles, like, Mara, are you, are you considering any of the fit around, you know, values, um, culture, those things that, that might be a little bit less tangible than a resume? When hiring? Definitely, yeah. So I hire all the time. We're always looking for interns and residents to join our team. And the Technical skills is definitely a part of it, and there is a technical evaluation, but there's a lot more to the recruitment process where we're really just looking to get to know who they are as people beyond their skills. Um, technical skills are something that you can teach along with the mentorship that you're providing on the team, but the culture and the value kind of match, but also add to the team is really important, and I think we'll get into this a bit in in future slides about why that piece is so important, especially for smaller companies. But yeah, we, we want to make sure that it's the right match, like both ways, um, because especially if you're joining a smaller team, one bad culture match can really make it tricky for the rest of the team. Yeah, so even if you're not thinking about these actively right now or you haven't in the past, you know, other people are. So it's definitely yeah. an advantage to try to, to build that into your, your exploration. I wanted to add in something, something that surprised me. Like I was in a couple of hiring committees, so like I kind of do have some of that. Something that surprised me is that even like, like you, when when they write up feedback on someone, like you could even see that there's feedback on things like what happened in lunch, like when you had lunch with the let's say um, team that you're gonna work with. So like it's like there is a really strong behavioral aspect that I really want to emphasize as well. Big plus on that, which brings us to this next point, right? So we just talked about what you might look for in a company. What will a company look for in you? And there's a big difference between the startup sector and, and big tech. So with startups, you're simultaneously trying to do an exploration of, is the person high quality? Do they know their work? Have they done this kind of research before? Are they in our space? But also the fit. And the fit is around that behavioral and you know, informational interview. What, what would they be like to collaborate with? Are they consensus driven? Are they a differentiated thinker and they have like a, you know, a unique take on every single problem and not just trying to give the same route response? And so when I say that there's more than just technical brilliance needed to get hired, it's like that is absolutely needed, plus there needs to be the culture fit and the team fit. And that is very hard to discern when, how many of you have looked at a startup website and you feel like that startup company culture is the same thing you've seen in other ones? Have you read it and you're like, oh, it all sounds the same? Well, it does on the website, but that's like, when you talk to them in person, you're gonna get a lot more of those flags and you wanna keep track of that to see, because they're valuing you if you fit that company culture and they're, of course, you're doing that same evaluation back. The, the really big plus with startups, of course, you get that team visibility much earlier on. So how many people did you end up meeting through your process? The whole like team? the interview? Yeah. Mm, five. Five, right. But at the time, they were small. 
they were like 10. <laughs> they were five. So you, okay, you met five of the five, right? You get a lot of visibility of who's in the team and you understand do you fit in or not. And there, to, to Mara's point, uh, a bad early hire, that's the kind of thing where if that happens in the first 20 hires, that reproduces itself. And so companies are very, very keen on screening for fit. And I've seen companies take people out of the equation even though they had perfect GPAs and great backgrounds because they said something that was rude or didn't seem like they'd be a good teammate, et cetera. So that fit piece is really important and you want to be on your best behavior, but also know that it's a very small ecosystem. So if you do something that is not really positive, that does get around, unfortunately. And then kind of on the flip side of that, they're looking for the fit, but one of the bonuses to working at a startup is if you get in early, you have more opportunity to help build that culture too. Whereas with larger tech, it's probably fairly well defined. If there's something that you're looking to maybe change or bring in, it might be a little bit harder, but if you get in kind of on the ground floor of a startup, you will be building that culture just with your day-to-day -day work too. I remember we had very explicit discussions on culture and like just um, like how do we bring in the values. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they, before I came, like they also had very explicit discussions on how to set those values. Yeah, so whereas with the larger tech, you're first focusing on quality, right? You're looking at, does this person pass the five or six or 10 assessments? Can they do the job? And then we'll match them to the right team. And so that team visibility coming later on could sometimes be a risk because you might not get the team you wanted or you thought you're gonna be on, right? So just to kind of go compare side by side, startup, you're doing a simultaneous comparison of quality and fit. With larger tech, you're doing the panel-based interviews first, and then they'll slot you into the right role. And certainly within larger companies, there are sometimes opportunities to transition, but I will say sometimes people assume it's easier to transition internally than it actually is. And so you might be very much surprised towards the end of your cycle of what team are you on and, and what you're working on. What sometimes happens also in maybe re very research-focused companies, like maybe DeepMind, is that you have, like, people who are called hosts or something, and they are recruiting for specific teams. So it's possible that you meet the specific team, and it's possible that you even you, have, you had known them before for like research collaborations. So sometimes it works that way, where you actually know you, where you're going. Yeah. Awesome. Any questions so far? OK. Oh, yes. We're going to get you the mic, sorry. We'll have to repeat for the, for the folks joining online. Thank you. Oh, uh, perfect, thank you. So I, I'm interested in entrepreneurship, and one of the things that's really interesting to me is kind of being on the other side of that interview project, or process. So being the person that has to see if there's a culture fit or building what that culture is. Yeah. So I was just wondering from across the panel, what are some tips that you kind of have to see either the right questions or to see if kind of they know either what they're talking about or they would be a good fit long term? Do you want me to go first? That's a great question. I feel like this is uh, going to be a, a hot ticket uh, <laughs> panel for, for that. So yeah, let's, let's dig into that uh, quickly here. Go ahead, Mara. So I think what a lot of organizations are doing now is there's the technical interview, but there's also like a culture or a peer interview where the questions aren't technical. Amy has some wild questions that we ask <laughs> just really to get to know people. And the panel is just peers, so just colleagues who you may not be reporting directly to, but you'll probably be interacting with. And the questions are just designed to get to know you more as a person, what you do on the weekends, what drives you, where you do your best work, what your favorite snack is, like kind of across the board. Um, that's something that we do that seems to work just to get to know them on a non-technical level. Yeah, and just to add briefly to that, I think one of the, the things to look for um, from across the table, and if you're emerging talent, things to, to plan for is to um, be able to demonstrate like that you can work effectively on a cross-disciplinary team. We all know that AI specifically doesn't happen you know, in a silo um, a, an, in application in particular. Um, we need people that have technical skills but also can work with people. And specifically, you're going to know yourself and your people best, so you bring that perspective and can, can put a process together uh, you know, it doesn't have to mirror what we do at Amy necessarily, but a reason that we do that and have those peer interviews across different teams uh, within the organization 
is so that we can really get a sense of how those people are going to interact um, in addition to the, the technical skills. I'll add some of what I've seen. So um, also, I've been kind of involved in this startup and like actually um, suggesting ways to like interview people as well. Um, so part of some of the things that um, could be considered are things like pair programming and simulating how you would actually work. Um, the other thing is like pair problem solving, maybe through a math problem or something through ML. Um, the other thing is that a lot of things actually arise in like very natural situations. Just like th they would have you know multiple interviews throughout a full day of interviews. These are for the people who came in on sites, and you know there would be some gap where they would have lunch, and that would actually be sometimes very telling about a lot of different things. You'd be surprised. <laughs> The, the two other things I'd say, one is there's a phenomenal book that a lot of entrepreneurs have read about hiring called Who by Jeffrey Smart. It's a, like literally W-H-O, Who. Um, it's about hiring and really asking questions multiple times from different people and seeing is the response consistent. That sounds maybe redundant, but you learn a lot from how that changes person to person. And then I think the, just kind of seeing the, the kind of the pace and how is it clicking is like are both parties really moving the ball forward and trying to progress in the interview process? You shouldn't feel like you're you know pulling someone in. You should get more excited about them as the process goes on. And I think one of the things that excites you know excited me or, or founders I worked with is like has someone gotten better the harder the challenge has been. So as the job gets more difficult, do they actually get better at what they do or are they kind of growing you know linearly and just repeating a similar process. So in startups, they really like differentiated thinkers where you know, you're going to put a different hat on for a different problem, and you're also going to get better at the, at the whatever problem you're solving, even as it gets more challenging. Kind of like you'd go from you know, algebra to calculus, and you actually get a better student when you're taking calculus than algebra. That's what you want to look at for startups, because the problems are only going to get harder. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, this oh. is a really good question. Um, so thank you for that. Um, again, if you have Should questions throughout, we want to we want to cover that. But um, last piece that I, I do want to just share on this that I it's advice I've heard from other entrepreneurs and kind of being part of the startup community. You you might have heard before, but the notion of like hire slow and, and fire fast. Uh, we talked a little bit about why you know it's important, especially with a small team, to to think about culture and to make sure that you have a, a healthy team as they're growing. Um, that, you know, as a methodology might be something to, to reflect on and how you kind of build out process and select people. Did you have a final thought? I guess a final thought to come back to this point. One thing that I felt was really good to look for for people who are joining startups is like taking initiative. And I don't know, that shows up in very unusual ways. I don't know how to even characterize it. Um, sometimes they just do things that surprise you and maybe come up with an article, connect it back to the knowledge that you have in the interview. Like it's, it's, it's surprising sometimes. Yeah. And a it's synthesizer a, it's, who's also like not mm -hmm. just regurgitating but thinking of new things. Exactly. We're going to start running through things a bit faster because I want to get to the case studies so you see how people navigate their careers. Um, but we can always go back to a previous slide if, if you so wish. So why join a startup? We talked about some of these things. I will caveat here also, when I say startup, I'm talking about a seed Series A or Series B company. I'm not talking about a company that has thousands of employees and just hasn't gone public yet. So when we think about startup, it's about the earlier stages, whether it's that five-person company or a few dozen people. Sorry, is there no universal definition for a startup? What, what's you got to discover your, that on your own. What's your maximum for the range so that people know? Oh, no, I mean, everything counts as a startup if it has not not yeah, a public company. But for the purpose of this, right, it's thinking about when you join early, you're joining, that's something a bit undefined, right? And so just to have kind of these, sorry? Yeah. It's a broadly used but term, right? Yep. Yeah, just for the folks online, uh, anecdote there around how the term startup is really uh, used uh, freely. So it, it might vary from community to community, from company to company. And something to think about um, if you're interested in exploring the world of startups is how different organizations do attach that, themselves to that, that term, because it, it will vary. So good point. Thank you.
Um, Yulia, can just so that people can anchor in like something real, can you give examples of startups on uh, multiple like? So Stripe series? is technically still a startup, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so is Atomic, which is at the Series A stage, right? And so it has way fewer people. Um, when I think of Stripe, I think of something that's venture backed and raised some amount of, mon of funding, but maybe they're still in like pilot phases and trying to build their minimum viable product, or maybe they're starting to scale that and seeing some product market fit. Mm -hmm. So th the word is, is loaded, I understand, um, but we are thinking kind of earlier stage. And so when you think about why join some of these businesses, you know, one is obviously that kind of hockey stick growth, not just for the business itself, but what kind of things you'll be exposed to. And you're like not taking a staircase or like linear approach to what you grow and the things you touch, but just getting a lot more exposure earlier on. Um, there's also immediate ownership, whether you're an intern or a full-time you know, new grad student there, you're getting real projects to work on. And, and some of the examples I'll share shortly, people were surprised with the amount of ownership they were dealt with. And the reality is, um, Somebody has to do it, and so if you're if you're in the room, that will be you know for you to work on, and obviously with some um, some help from leadership. But there is true ownership in these companies. That also means if you fail, that's on you, right? Um, another thought here, kind of number three, around you learn how to launch a product or scale a product. This is very much tied to the stage and team size you join. So if you're joining at the Series A or B, you're going to be a lot more involved on seeing it go from zero to one. If you're joining a Series D or E, et cetera, you're starting to see different things happen, like new product lines, maybe internationalization efforts, et cetera. So be aware for when you're joining a startup, the stage will also correlate with what you're going to see happen in the business. And then of course, working with world-class innovators and then sometimes the compensation, right? The equity can really be meaningful, especially the earlier on you join. I'll add, um, or are we wanting to power through? No, no, okay. add on. Just, just the opportunity to be invited to the table more at a startup, like invited to the conversation. We kind of touched on culture, but just in general, your other duties as required, there's probably gonna be a lot of them when you're working with a smaller group, but that's where you're gonna learn a lot of skills that you probably won't have the opportunity to learn at a, a larger firm. You're gonna be able to hone in on some maybe interests and skills that you didn't even know you had just because they needed help and you were there at the table and they wanted your input and, and your help. Yeah, I was like, I mean, in bigger companies, they don't take the input of interns and like hiring senior people. They were taking my input and hiring like pretty, pretty, really senior engineers sometimes and scientists. So that was really cool. You've got the power, I love it. All right, <laughs> how do you evaluate a startup? So for candidates, right, think about the team, the strategy, is there some kind of moat around the technology? Is there special access to data, et cetera? What's the market like? What's the total adjustable market? Who are the customers? Are there big names? Are there Fortune 500 names? Or are the customers uh, places you haven't heard about yet? Obviously, the better the name, the, those core, you know, those anchor clients, the more that success will be able to replicate itself. So do ask questions about who are you actively working with or who are you in talks with, who's in the sales pipeline, and of course, what's the core technology. Now, from the investor point of view of you know, evaluating a startup, the, the question is what's going to be the rate of return on the investment? And so what investors care about is, is this a product that needs to exist, right? Is there a product market fit? And will customers pay good money for it? And this is very important. There's lots of amazing products out there that people do not want to pay for. So be able to ask in your process, how are you monetizing this? Because companies go out of business when they run out of money, right? So think about why is the company uniquely positioned to succeed and what is the revenue and commercial side of why it yeah. works or not. I'm, I'm also going to mention that these are, in a way, kind of just the tip of the iceberg. So when you think about how different the world of startups is, from startup to startup, how you evaluate them is going to look a lot different. Are they a B2C company? Are they a B2B company? So this is something that you can actively learn on your own. There's some really great resources out there, great venture capital firms, you know, some of which have office hours uh, today, uh, that you can, you can explore these things and, and learn uh, to inform yourself so that you can better evaluate these things for your career journey as well. OK, we'll do a quick question here. Uh, so, like, one thing I would like to ask is, like, 
uh, like the real world problem solving skills comparing with like all the kind of technical skills that you have learned from universities, for example, learn from your master degree or undergraduate degree, like which one is more important? Because I have already started on a creative project which is improve the safety standard of those industries, like for example, chemical industries or those factories. So the one thing I have noticed after I talked with several factory managers is that like, uh, like in some cases, like there is a theory inside those kind of safety industry called Six Sigma. It means like some like safety accidents will probably be occurred or happen inside those industries, with a probability of like uh, one, like one to the ten to the negative six percent. So it is a really low probability for those kind of accidents to be happen inside those like factories. But actually, that's not the case. Because after like 50 years of analysis of the risks and accidents happening inside those factories, it seems like the probabilities for those accidents are much, much higher than their expectation. So I think like there might be some kind of gap between the theory that you have learned from the class and the real world problems. So no matter what kind of like regression model you have learned, for example, softmax regression, multi like linear linear regression, or even like multi-class classification model, you can already build them in class. But actually, when you are trying to solve this kind of real-world problem, that's not the case. It's like their knowledge is not enough to actually understand the real-world complexity of this problem. So how do you think about so, this? So the likelihood of me being able to reiterate your question is probably lower than that 10 to the negative 6 that you mentioned <laughs> yeah. um, to, to, to do it effectively. But uh, if I can try to sort of uh, capture the cliff notes here, you're asking, like, what is, uh, what is more important uh, between you know, those, those hard skills? Uh, and I, I don't think there's a, a one-size-fits-all answer to that. But it's something that you need to explore uh, as part of your journey as well, the type of opportunity that you're applying to. Um, so there's, there's not always going to be that like, single answer, one size fits all. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe reemphasize what we talked about earlier, is just the importance of soft skills and cross-team collaboration. You're not always going to be um, in a conversation with someone who knows what a linear regression model is or a general value function. And so being able to understand who is your audience, how do I build a connection to the person on the other side or on the stage, um, that's going to help you to, to get better. And, and you can practice those things by talking to people, applying for jobs, interviewing, going to career mixers, and things like that. So sorry to just jump in on that one. But anything else to add? I do have a perspective that it's like your time as a master's or a PhD student, for example, I'm just emphasizing maybe research, um, could actually transfer and be useful because there are multiple ways. First of all, you're developing a network and that's been immensely useful for me inside, like within the university and then within conferences. And then the second thing is that like as a researcher, you're navigating a lot of uncertainty and you have to like shape your project all the way and you know mold it multiple times. And that element actually shows up in startups quite a bit. If you're doing it actively rather than like relying on the supervisor to tell you exactly what to do, if you're taking a lot of initiative, it actually mirrors that skill like in, when, you do, when you go for startups, especially research-focused ones uh, like the one that I went to. Absolutely. And I also think the point around like seeing the real life applications, which you, know, you start to see in the process of your project, like all the more reason to get the industry experience sooner versus staying in research only for yeah you know, as long as you can, because that's the safer option, quote unquote. Um, we're gonna, so just kind of sum up, startups are focusing on quality and fit simultaneously. Larger tech, you're thinking about that fit a little bit later, and you get matched to the team a bit later. Um, in terms of the actual searches, right, so startups, you're gonna find opportunities through industry conferences, uh, definitely go and meet, you know, every company who's there, but also th see if people are starting things or hear of classmates starting things. Um, career fairs, there's, of course, on-campus career fairs. There's also things that are virtually hosted. Uh, I know that Esther has been to a few of our virtually hosted networking events with our companies as well as companies that are in our orbit but not in our direct portfolio. There's also this uh, third item around VC funds. A lot of them have venture capital firms, and so a lot of what funds try to do is add value to their companies by connecting them to the right talent. And there's people whose job it is, like mine, to find interesting candidates that would not have otherwise heard of the business, understand what the candidates 
perspective is, and then help match make them to the right company and help them get in process. And so a lot of funds now have this talent function, and this might even be somebody who's more receptive to talking with you than, say, a recruiter inside a company. So that's like a different way into a startup. It's this talent function within VC. There's also tech news, right? Obviously, follow your local news, follow, uh, the Wall Street Journal tech section, New York Times tech section. I also love using Google alerts aggressively for sectors or people and companies I'm interested in, seeing who's leaving where, who's getting acquired. Set those alerts so that it's top of mind for you and you hear about the companies first before even the, the news gets out you know, more broadly. And then there's also using news and lists like the Wealthfront career launching list. It's a really you know, it's been around for many years, and it focuses on companies that are already seeing product market fit, and they've been evaluated by this group that has had a very good track record of finding up and coming companies. So there's lists like that. With any list you use, do read the disclaimer on how they make their decisions. Are they deciding based on, uh, you know, how much money they raise, therefore they're the career launching startup, or are they deciding based on the products that they've launched or the clients they have? But these lists are a great way to start your search and, and look for new things. And of course, last but not least, relationships and networks, which a lot of folks here already you know, said around referrals or somebody wrote nepotism. But relationships <laughs> do matter a lot. And people hold access to companies and ideas that might not be publicly disclosed yet. Yeah, I, I want to take just a quick second to emphasize that you have the ability now to start building those relationships um, you know, immediately. And so. Uh, a challenge that I often see, um, particularly in, in people uh, that might be you know, grad students that are interested in startups, uh, is often the only person they'll like, talk to about this is like, either other students or their like, they're, like, grad supervisor. And that's not always the like, most informed perspective. And not to say there's not potentially like, great advice and great connections to be had there, but I think you need to like, look beyond that a little bit more. It's a, something that I, I really encourage students to do is, access the really active and available startup community that's around you, whether that's here in Alberta or across Canada through venture funds. People are always willing to you know, share what they're working on and, and share their insight. So you can build really good connections just through sharing what you're doing and asking questions to some of the people that might have gone through a, a career search recently or been part of a, a joining a startup recently. They can really give you a, a more informed perspective than what might be kind of the path of least resistance. And then the bonus of that is when and if those people are hiring, they already know you and the relationship wasn't built so immediately through, hey, I need a job, but now they know you, they know what you're about, what your interests are, and your foot is just going to be in the door. Yeah. I don't know if you had a thought, but. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I want to emphasize actually academic conferences for it. Like it sometimes actually is multi-purpose in some sense. Um, and you actually get to meet really cool, interesting people in industry and startups. I remember Atomic actually went and like recruited inside NURPS. Um, A lot of people recruit in NURPS. Like that's the conference you want to go to. So yeah, so like that, that happens and you can have interesting conversations that way. And then one good strategy is to um, look at your alumni network as well. And if you find them in conferences, they could actually introduce you to a whole lot of people. So then you get to expand your network in like really interesting ways that you didn't anticipate. And also on the relationships piece and meeting people, like once you have a relationship, ask them who else they recommend you meet, right? That's how you're gonna grow that network and also hear of completely different things outside of your first degree connections. Mm -hmm. On the larger tech side, I mean, this is a little bit more, I think, tried and true to all of you, so you're familiar with you know, hackathons and case competitions. Um, so very much worth participating in. They're usually sponsored by larger companies, so that's who you're gonna get more exposure to. But thinking, so thinking about the searches, right, um, it's a little bit of a, there, there's a lot of crossover between how folks Find, so these, find these opportunities, um, but you want to be creative and use conferences, use your network, and continually grow. I had this analogy around, you want to be a big fish in a small pond within a startup, but actually you want to be a growing fish. And so the more startups that you start networking with, the more funds you start to meet, that is going to make you feel like you're not just siloed into one small community, but rather a large and growing community. 
also kind of the Greylock community kind of gave me that, to be honest. Oh, I'm glad. I, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, Greylock had invested in Atomic, and then there's, like... Right, you joined a five-person to... company. You thought you were joining mm. just five people. But then I was like, hey, there's actually tons of early career yeah. people in the community, and there's, like, well over 150 of them that you could meet. And I know you've met some, not all 150. Yeah. But, like, you're not just pigeonholing yourself. I think people are scared of getting pigeonholed in startups, but that's not the that's case. Not true. Because they're going to know people who work at other startups who have similar interests. And so exactly. you start, you have to put the effort to actually have those conversations, but it's a good point that it's not just a small community like that. Yeah, yeah and there's there's no right way, I think, is is uh, really worth thinking about when you're thinking about joining a startup, taking on an internship. Um, explore what you're interested in. Uh, don't necessarily just try to follow the path that you're hearing from your supervisor or the students around you. Yeah, and so to add to a few additional like starting points for your search as you start thinking about where do I apply, what do I do, certainly all those factors we mentioned count. I also think, you know, think of lists of top AI companies, whether it's the career launching list from Wealthfront or articles from, you know, business publications, that's one way to start thinking about what makes sense. You find a great company there, then consult a market map. Market maps are put out by a variety of funds as well as uh, industry analysts and see, okay, that company I saw, it was at the intersection of biotech and machine learning. Let's see on a market map of that space, who are the competitors? Who are other places that are getting started that I can apply to? Um, I think market maps are a great way to get a bit of clarity if you're not sure yet which path within ML you want to go down. And also think geographically, right? There's gonna be clusters of ML companies around a few ecosystems, whether it's here in Edmonton or in Silicon Valley, New York, et cetera. And you can start to map out what that looks like for your search that you're having a geographic approach. Yeah, I, I also wanna, I guess, reemphasize that this is, again, the tip of the iceberg and everyone's gonna use different tools. So a few that I can recommend locally, we talked a little bit about uh, Taproot Edmonton as a local news source. Um, it's really well curated media around like the tech community. So personally, I find myself like I rely on that a lot of times for awareness about events that I might be interested in, uh, companies that are raising dollars. You know, if you're not actively kind of you know signing up for the the right things, uh, you might never be aware of those things that are happening like right around you in the building across the street in some cases. So um, find the, the things that you can kind of passively tune into that might come into your inbox every once in a while. Um, I'll also give a shout out to Ezra, who's one of our like most active sharers on our Slack uh, student community, um, where there's other internships and postdoc positions and things that she's like, well, this is cool. Like Other people will find that interesting. You can also kind of be an amplifier uh, and share those opportunities with the people around you, and uh, you know that that can always come back into kind of being a, a part of a, a meaningful connection or building awareness to an opportunity that someone secures and kind of building rapport with them as well. So how you use these resources is more effective than which ones you use, um, but you can you know explore and find the things that are the right fit for you. Go ahead. And since our people are from like many different places, I want to emphasize like. If, in, to actually like build a community in your universities, in wherever you are, um, where sharing and sharing opportunities is is the norm and is the culture, and that's I think what be, we've been trying to do with like the opportunity sharing initiative that we've had at Amy right now, and I really hope that people you know start taking this into account more in wherever they are. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually give a quick shout out to a, a book that I think a lot of our Amy staff and leadership um, have uh, kind of built some, some philosophies around, which is uh, building startup communities by Brad Feld. Um, so one thing that, that Brad Feld shares in terms of like building healthy startup communities is this kind of give first mentality. Uh, so if you're a growing tech community that is constantly, you know, asking, what are you working on? How can I help? Versus, like, what's in it for me? Um, and waiting on the sidelines for the thing that you want versus kind of exploring and being helpful, um, building rapport, building relationships. That's a, a really uh, impactful thing that you can do in, in any tech community, whether that's a major center uh, or a smaller center. Uh, and so. Think about kind of how you can build that philosophy into the way that you interact with people at career mixers and meetups and things like that as well. And it really can lead to more opportunities coming mm -hmm. to you because you're now the person who's organizing them so people want to reach out to you and get to know you. The number of times I have people who are like the head of a career advancement for their club reach out to me to help their club, but then I'm like, oh, like what are you up to, right? Because that's the person who's trying to help me and I, of course, want to help them. 
Um, one last idea around tracking opportunities, start to track networks and people, right? So you think about the PayPal mafia. I don't know if you've all heard of the PayPal mafia. It's all the early group that started PayPal that they went off to do really interesting and uh, big companies in Silicon Valley. Here you see the Google brain and DeepMind Mafia and a few of these companies like Adept and Atomic um, and Inflection, they're actually in the Greylock portfolio. And so it's people are going to invest in people that they know and trust and starting to track who are the founders and people in a community that you think are impressive and like follow them on LinkedIn, set an alert for them on Google, on Google Alerts, see what they are doing and follow kind of the train of people that you're most inspired by. That's a really good point. And um, maybe even if you're supervised by someone who's part of the mafia, I don't know if I, I'm not like <laughs> rescinding that. Okay. We're not referring to any one supervisor as, as mafiosos. But um, the, the network that your supervisor has is, is something that you can leverage, but you might want to be a little bit more like tactful and strategic about it. It's not asking your supervisor like, how do I build a startup? That might not be their core like expertise area. They might have thoughts of, they'll probably always share their thoughts about it. That might not always be uh, a, a great thing, but you could ask them, you know, how many of your previous students have started a company? What are the companies? And being able to connect with those people directly, that might be a better path to kind of getting, uh, building a broader perspective and, and network as well that's readily available to you. Go ahead. Uh, one really powerful, powerful way um, that I found for understanding networks, this is maybe a bit research oriented, is that I would look at co-author lists and that was like incredibly powerful for understanding exactly where people went and exactly how am I even connected to them eventually. Um, like for example, like maybe Raphael here, I tech, like not, it wasn't direct like that, but Technically, my supervisor was at DeepMind, and he was an intern there at some point. So I had rough ideas about what DeepMind did, at least. But my point is that you can sort of start inferring networks from uh, Google Scholar and co-author lists. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of networks and making things happen in creative ways, I wanted to go through some direct examples of six people, including yours truly, and how they got their jobs, right? Because I think a lot of people think it's a easier path, but I want to show some of the dips in and out between academia, industry, uh, and startups, and have Esra as well as a few other examples to talk through how these things actually come to be. And so we initially met through a women starting up event I hosted about women in machine learning, and that's how you got first exposed to Atomic. So I'd love for you to share a little bit of how you saw and ended up with a really interesting opportunity in the Bay Area when you were at Carlton back then, I think. No, no, I was here. You were already here. You were I was here. in the U of A. Yeah. But like, how did you t tell people a little bit of like how you made that opportunity come through and how you did a lot of the creative work up front to, to enable that? Yeah, so th there's maybe some background work is that, you know, I did have some fundamentals in ML um, and I kind of understood some of the landscape about like, oh, AlphaFold and like recent advancements. So I had some common language that I could talk, talk with other people. Um, so that was useful in coming prepared, you know? And uh, so in this, this actual event, like, I did not anticipate that I would get a job. It was actually pretty early on, even, in the, in the semester, at least. Yeah, it was in the, like, early fall, but you yeah. were still prepared. I, I <laughs> you didn't kind of, anticipate, but you prepared. I did not anticipate that at all. Um, I was kind of more doing a relaxed sort of searching through, perusing, looking at different companies. Um, so at that stage, it was more like, oh, if a company had reached out to me, then I would have responded. But, like, it wasn't super active yet. Um, but what really was cool is that when I looked at the list of companies, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, like, I really want to just stay at that booth for the whole time. <laughs> and it really resonated. A um, couple handful of things resonated. First of all, um, the very first thing I check for is people. So I, the CEO was, is actually really wonderful, like Raphael. We had him there in the uh, DuPont Mafia. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so, like, you can get a sense of that, of how, how this person's expertise um, is when you talk with them. And how they treat you is important as well. And then the, um, so that really resonated. The other thing is that I wanted to look for, you know, ML core companies. So that checked the box, because Atomic was doing 3D structure prediction for RNA using ML. 
And the other thing also I was looking for was impact. So if we do this, we unlock, like, we could unlock developing a lot of medicines for many diseases that we couldn't have done anything for. Um, so I think that those were the criteria that I had in mind. And the way it evolved was really weird. Like, it wasn't straightforward. The very first thing that happened is um, we just talked and chatted about researchy things. And then I kind of pitched him, and I was like, like, would you be interested in just having me as, a, as an intern? <laughs> like, I, there was no job posting. I was not straightforward. Um, I just was really impressed with his paper, and I was like, wow, I want to be part of that. And I really just pitched him on that. And he was like, yeah, let's have a chat. And we had a chat. It wasn't nothing formal. And by the end of it, I was like, so do you want to move forward with like ML engineer some kind of uh, thing? And he's like, yeah, let's do it then. <laughs> so it really evolved very organically, I think. It, he wasn't like, oh, here, here's the job that you're going to apply for. Um, and there was nothing visible, at least. They were mostly searching for full timers at that point. Yeah, and part of what I want to highlight is it was also very early on in the company. Very Oftentimes, early. the earlier on it is, the more open people are to random chats, and they don't have prescriptive roles that they're trying to fit people into. And so, you know, it was a, a good timing in the, in the business where mm -hmm. there was room for spontaneity yeah. and room exactly. to just start a conversation initially around the research itself and then draw it into, mm -hmm. here's what an internship could look like. Th yeah. That's actually a good clarifier. I do just want to add that, you know, you can take a similar approach, and especially for earlier stage companies, you can, you can get access. But mm -hmm. this isn't a you know license to just email every CEO at companies that you want to work with and say like, I would like to do an internship with you, and expect <laughs> that you're going to get the same result that Ezra was able to find here. I think the the uh, the insight from from this case is it was really about kind of building that relationship first, familiarity, and like building a connection versus kind of applying for a job just because you wanted to, to create it. I want to emphasize, like, I was super excited to the extent that I was like, yeah, do you have, like, anything open source that I can contribute to? Do you have, like, like, I was ready to do something without being officially with them even. And I even offered, like, oh, do you want me to, like, connect you to people? Like, I, I was just really wanted them to succeed. Like, that's it. Um, whether they wanted me to be officially there or not, but eventually it worked out that way. My point is that giving, giving and being a giver and thinking about what's in it for also the other person is also sometimes something that is a helpful mentality and comes back to you. I love that. And also contributing to open source or being active. I have a friend who runs an AI company, and there's a Discord for his company. And I said, how have you hired your first 15 hires? He's found a lot of them through Discord. He's like, these people were contributing to my company for free. And of course, I had to hire them because they were doing excellent work. right? And then I'm like, you've kind of been battle tested. You've showed what you can deliver. So I mean, think creatively, not just like, like reaching out and talking about someone's research, but if there's a Discord community around a product you've been using, be involved, be a top voice, right? Actively contribute, share those opportunities. People notice that and then they get hired. And it's a, a very fun way to get hired. It is. And you get like really great fit that way. Exactly. Because like you know the work. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe we can talk in a little bit towards the end about your story of how you help someone else find their fit sure. with Atomic. So the next example we'll go through is somebody else who went to the same company, went to Atomic AI, which, as Ezra mentioned, is a Series A company that's, um, that's working with kind of using machine learning-based approach to find RNA-based therapeutics for really hard-to-treat diseases. This is somebody who I had first met in 2021. She was a student at Stanford studying math, music, and computer science a bevy of different things. And we had met right after she had completed a quant trading internship, right? Her focus within CS was actually ML, but she wanted to go to a quant firm because that's something a lot of her peers were doing. Quickly realized that was not the right culture and wanted to find something that had more mission alignment. Um, so she reached out to me and we started to look at what are potential opportunities for you. And one of the companies she was most excited about was starting to work at M with an ML um, kind of bent, but it was not the core product. And so they were saying, you know, interview for a back end role, and then maybe in a year or two, we can convert this into an ML role. Went through that process, decided she didn't kind of have that conviction yet, so actually went to big tech, went to work at Amazon. And back to that story we were sharing a bit earlier, Amazon does their fit towards the end of the process. So she spent all these cycles going through to discuss what the role would look like, and at the end of the day, ended up on a team that did very little that was related to ML, um, and had 
a decent summer. I mean, she learned from that summer that she liked software engineering a lot more than quant trading and working for that kind of environment or firm, but also realized that um, she really wants to optimize culture and she wants to have the visibility of what the business itself is going to be. So when we reconnected after the Amazon experience, um, her desire was to really work on something mission-driven. And so initially we were thinking, well, maybe there's something around working with an AI bias and explainability. But then when you have conversations with people, all sorts of new things come up. And you're like, oh, I don't know if Atomic would be a good fit, but like, take a look, read about the business, and see if it's interesting. And long story short, she ended up accepting the offer with Atomic, even though that was not at all the first company on her mind, right? It's a biotech ML company. You don't think of it as a... Uh, you know, like social mission. I mean, it, it is absolutely related, but that happened, that serendipity happened through a series of trials and error and conversation and being open to interviewing with a company that she knew very little about. The thing about this fit piece, and you know, you got to know the founder well and you saw that it worked for you, you don't really figure out the fit until you're in process, right? Interviewing is a contact sport. And so, the technology that might be similar across different companies, but the people who are building it and deploying it are very different. So you have to be open-minded to what that could look like and not also be afraid of like weaving in and out, right? She had made multiple attempts to join uh, a business as an ML engineer. There was an initial fit, you know, decided to go big tech, and then after big tech, back to startups. So you have to be flexible on that front. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, sometimes your, your plan A might not work out, but plan B can be just as good. We might actually demonstrate a little bit of that in this presentation, uh, since we're getting a little short on time and want to make sure that there's yes. time for your questions. We'll, so. we'll go quicker. I know earlier we <laughs> asked about rescinded offers. There was somebody, I think it was 15% of the room had felt this. And so rescinded offers can be really a sad way to get into a plan B, but sometimes plan B can be even more fun. So um, this is Fatima, who works at one of our companies called Tome. Tome is um, one of the fastest productivity tools actually ever to launch. And they're using uh, generative AI to help people have a creative and compelling storytelling experience to presentations. So we initially connected after um, she had accepted an offer at one of our companies. I was not the one responsible for it, but she did this very smart thing where she thanked me nonetheless. She's like, I'm so excited to join one of the companies and to be in this community. As Ezra mentioned, we have a community for early career folks in the companies. And she introduced herself to me even though I was not directly involved, but she kind of planted seeds with a few different people saying, hey, I'm so excited to be joining the startup sector after working in you know, big tech before that. Um, fast forward a few months later, unfortunately her offer was one of the many offers that got rescinded by the industry in fall of 20, 2022. And we worked really quickly to see what our plan B, and you know, there were not many options out there. And so this is an example of where the fit of her and the company made a lot of sense. So on paper, she was a, you know, a regular software engineer, but if you looked underneath the personal interests, there's a lot of work she had done that was creative, that was in videography, in film, et cetera. And so we were able to paint a narrative and reach out to a company that two, did not have a new grad role posted and say, hey, I know you're not actively hiring, but I've gotten this amazing, amazing feedback from the company that unfortunately had to rescind her offer. That she's an exceptional engineer, that's A. Point two, or B, um, really interesting fit where it's somebody with a very strong creative lens and then C, wouldn't you take like a bet and talk to this person, just have one conversation. So it like makes a little wedge of how the candidate can get in the door. And of course she had to absolutely nail the process, but the company she joined is like, the user growth has been completely unbelievable. Uh, it's a really fun fit. It's a, it's a creative culture. It's very engaging. And this is a plan B that's even better than the initial, you know, first plan. Um, so I want to, I think from this example, just emphasize Follow through on your search, regardless of how it goes. Keep people along for the ride, even if you don't think you'll need to, you know. It's, it's always better to make the connection there either than not, and then that can actually accelerate your search if there's a situation where the offer is rescinded. Yeah, I think that notion of like building your relationships for the long term and where that, this is an example of where that can really pay off. 
And what was really excellent here was a lot of people, unfortunately, had gotten their offers rescinded, and they just came to me or other talent people saying, I need a role ASAP, right? And like, I'll take anything. What she was very clear on is, here are the unique things about me as an engineer. I'm not just any engineer, but I have X, Y, and Z additional flavors to me, and so you're able to position somebody more as an individual and open up that kind of that conversation and say, hey, just have one conversation, have great feedback. The other thing I'll mention too, just before I forget this point, I had mentioned uh, a few kind of slides ago, a lot of funds have talent people, and the people that we're really keen on helping are the people who already worked in our companies or will be working. And so the first group of students and new grads I was trying to help the most are the people who are kind of in the family, right? It's similar, like you're now in the family even though you're not at the company anymore, but I will always take your call and prioritize it first because you already have met the bar of what these companies are looking for. I've gotten great feedback and I'm going to want to keep adding fuel to a fire, which is like a really great candidate. I don't know if you had a thought there. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, quickly going through the next uh, three folks. So this is Magdi. He and I met um, when he was in 2020, right out of uh, Stanford, had studied initially at the University College of London, always been really interested in ML, and then came to Stanford to do his master's in ML. Uh, ended up joining a small company of just two dozen folks uh, working at a company called Gridspace. It was born out of the Stanford ecosystem. And we connected initially about, you know, I'm working in, he was working in LA, working at this company, and starting to think about you know, in a year or two, he might be ready to move on. So super early on, just an exploratory conversation. Um, and we talked a little bit about what might make sense. And at that point, he was working for like an NLP and speech analytics startup. And so we were thinking most immediately about what are similar companies to that skill set in our portfolio. But nothing kind of happened with the search until a year and a half later when comes the new year, everyone's looking for new jobs and he's like, you know, I'm ready to make the jump. Um, and he had already primed me like a year and a half ago of like what he'd be looking for, right? He wants to go even more early stage. Uh, he wants to have a lot of exposure to what the business is doing, not just the engineering side. And um, we ended up like getting him in process and interviewed to onsite within like just three weeks, right? Because it's somebody who's building a relationship early on before he needed to kind of like cash the check and say, I need this job. Um, and he was able to show really tremendous growth between when we first connected to when we connected a year and a half later. He talked about bigger projects he had done and like what was the impact of that work. Yeah, this is something that I've seen mirrored actually in, in some hiring with Mara's team. So uh, we offer a number of work integrated learning opportunities uh, at Amy where we actually work with emerging talent to place them on projects directly with, with Amy and with our client network. So it's a chance to kind of get a little bit of experience outside of the lab, like while you're still a student. Um, and what we often see is, you know, talent that they, they do a great job and they, they build great relationships uh, with those teams and are often, you know, top of mind talent when there's opportunities that come up uh, down the road. So we have actually filled internship positions with some of our most active Willow participants uh, in the past on Mars team, so. Totally, yeah, it's just, again, it's about building those connections before you need to cash the check. When I know your name and your face, of course, when I see your resume come through, I'm going to look at it, right? Because I know you, I'm, I maybe feel like I'm a friend of yours. I'm looking at an intern who sort of, I built that relationship with before, you know, there was a role and then it worked out in the end. So just, again, building those connections before you need them is good. All right, we're gonna wrap up with the last two examples and wrap up with the a few questions. So um, there's a student uh, that I initially met in 2018. She had worked, uh, she had found her first internship at a startup through Greylock Tech Fair, which we'll chat briefly about in a little bit, but worked at a two dozen person company that was born out of research at MIT C-Cell Lab, realized it was really interesting work to work with academics who were commercializing their research. And so essentially the company Instabase that she was interning at was in our portfolio. Um, and they're a platform for like automating really human intensive business operations processes. She loved that experience, realized she does not need all the handholding that she had previously received at Google as a PM and decided for the next one, I'm gonna go even earlier on. Uh, and at the same time was running parallel processes and interviewing with various PhD programs and got a few different offers and so came to me and was saying, you know, do I do the PhD path? Do I go back to Instabase? Do I maybe look at a brand new company? Uh, and so ended up interviewing at a handful of businesses and selecting to work once again for a 
team that was coming out of academia, this time it was a team coming out of Carnegie Mellon, but focused on AI explainability. And she decided to work with um, you know, a very small team that gave her a ton of responsibility early on. And now, two and a half years later, after working that business, she's starting her own venture, her own startup, by working with a professor back from her MIT days. So she was very good at like staying in touch with the broader MIT network, weaving in and out of like, do I take the academic path? And she ended up deferring the PhD program, but then is not going after all. Uh, but realized through the course of spending two and a half years in an early stage company, you don't need to get the PhD to launch the business. You can just work with your prior advisor or, or people who you already know. Yeah, this is such a fun kind of network effect that is often not thought of. But we've seen a similar example uh, recently in our community with a, a postdoc coming here and working with one of our Amy fellows and then starting a, a company from, from that relationship. So you never know who you're going to start a company with. It might even be your supervisor. Yeah, and building a portfolio of experiences across, you know, she was doing research at MIT in healthcare, uh, the applications of ML in healthcare, but then also did the commercial side of enterprise SaaS at Instabase, and then got to see, you know, longer term, well, how do we think about AI explainability and helping businesses apply that as they um, are, you know, wor working through their, uh, their clients. So building a portfolio of experiences that then gave her the background to be able to launch a business. Last case study. Um, so startup to Apple to startup to founder. So this is um, Shreya, who works at the same business as Magdi, uh, which is a low-code deep learning platform. She had um, worked at a Pinterest as an ML intern for a bit, uh, realized right out of her grad program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that she wanted to go to a startup, joined a startup that was like very close to running out of money. Right at the moment, it was a, a company called Drive.ai, um, and she was working with like deep learning perception models for, for LiDAR. That company was starting to run out of money, got acquired by Apple. She ended up spending two years at Apple in the ML group. So you know, even though the company didn't work out, there's still some kind of next choice. And then realized she wants to be a founder herself. So for her next opportunity, she was looking to join a founder who had built something before, um, a repeat entrepreneur, as you say, um, and started to explore a variety of companies that, um, you know, at, at she, had, she ended up having a lot of choices, actually. She had such a broad, broad breadth of experience. But she ended up choosing a company that was founded by a researcher uh, named Piero Molino, who had built uh, a, a really fabulous tool called Ludwig at Uber. And she joined him as a repeat founder with the intention and in, in saying, you know, I eventually want to be an entrepreneur. Join as the first machine learning engineer put her hand up to not just work on the technology itself, but also be involved with early clients, uh, these pilots, et cetera. And now, a year and a half after that, she recently left to be building her own startup. So these six examples are really meant to show that you want to build a portfolio of experiences that's going to give you various exit options. I think what we really all saw in the last year is that sticking to only one area, whether it's just academia or just industry or just big tech, that's not necessarily a recipe for um, stability and safety. Uh, getting a different dimension through working at a startup, and maybe that's the startup that will make you realize, oh, I want to, yes, continue to focus on ML, but also more broadly be an engineer, right? Weave in and out, um, that's going to give you the experiences that let other people take a bet on you versus being super one-sided and like super in the niches or niche. Um, I think there's there's a, a bit of a, a complexity and maybe sometimes double-edged sword with being overly niche focused where people then pigeonhole you into one thing only. Now you can say you've done the startup thing, you've done the academia thing, you know, and, and highlight others. Um, but yeah, like some like I worked in RL, and then I worked at a company that mostly supervised learning stuff, right? So, but you start to see also common connections, and that's very intriguing and thrilling to do. Exactly. Awesome. I don't know if you had a thought. Go We're ahead. gonna finish up. All right. Uh, just a few books that I truly recommend for the job search. Uh, I will not recommend this if it wasn't worth your time. But one is um, thinking about 
it's a very specific process called the two-hour job search of how do you actually populate that list of 40 or 50 different companies to approach instead of only focusing on, you know, open AI. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a really great strategy for how to do that in the book. The second one is about the startup of you, right? Writ written by Reid Hoffman, who's a partner at Greylock, but also a really great thinker about careers, alumni networks, and weaving your path in and out and maintaining those relationships, but also taking bets throughout the course of your career. And the last one is called The International Advantage, which is a student, uh, which is a book that a lot of international students really love about how do you position yourself for a job in a market that you're not originally from. All right, I think we're at yeah. the takeaways piece. Yeah, we'll jump right into questions. So we'll grab a, a quick question here and then uh, if anyone has, feel free to raise a hand here. And, and if not, we do have a quick. Uh, yeah, there's a question in the back. Oh, we do. Sorry, the lights uh, make it real tough for me to see these old eyes. Uh, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the great discussion. Um, so I have a question about uh, someone who's uh, about to start a career. So uh, at the beginning of a career, uh, would it be more helpful to work at a big tech or a startup to gain credibility? Uh, so maybe either for a resume or um, for future opportunities. Okay, so that's something I think about a lot too. <laughs> um, I think that there is, you know, a case for that. But it's just that people just have different paths and different tolerances for how they want to go about life, right? Um, one thing that Yulia emphasized and that I really liked is this, uh, what is it called, J-curve? Oh, the J-curve <laughs> of like how you grow? Yeah, so like, Sometimes when you take bets and you take risks, you actually end up growing a lot more. I feel like the big tech path, if you just take it and like keep at it, like it ends up being a little bit linear. Um, but at the same time, like you could gain credibility through that, as, as you say. So sometimes it ends up being powerful as you move from big tech to a startup to say like I came from that, so I know certain practices. But it's also very powerful sometimes to go from a startup to like another startup, and because you have that entrepreneurial experience that transfers really well. Yeah, I think the short answer is there's no there's no right answer, and yeah. that that's something for you to explore on your own based on your aspirations, how you prioritize some of the different things we we went through. Um, I do want to we're right at time here, so I. I want to take a quick minute to give a round of applause for all this excellent perspective you heard from our panelists. And now some, some real-time advice. So we, we talked a little bit. You can use this QR code to, to jump in to get some more info about the tech fair event that uh, Yulia mentioned. It's coming up in a, a few weeks. So highly encourage you to check that out. I'm, I'm hoping to tune in as well. Um, and then right now, you can actually put into practice uh, some of what we discussed. So um, this notion of how you build relationships. It's not always about the obvious questions like what roles are you hiring for? What does your company do? Think about the things that you can find you know, online on your own uh, through your own gumption and try to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, so these are some examples of what you might want to discuss. Um, so again, every company is going to be a little bit different. Not every company that you're going to see might even have a position available. Uh, you want to think about what you can learn and what you can build uh, from that, that interaction uh, over the long term. So right now, um, we're actually going to be heading down the street to the Pendennis building for the talent mixer that starts at, at 2 p.m. So I would encourage you to put a lot of what we just heard into practice and join us there and meet some cool companies. And thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Upper Bound journey. Uh, this was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you.